I want to talk, in fact, about this question of whether Shakespeare was a violent anti-Semite. I've grappled, really, for all my life with uh, what it means to engage with uh, texts uh, that have this um, deep aversion to, uh, to my identity. Particularly, what is our relationship to it at this moment, when anti-Semitism is manifestly on uh, a resurgence? introduce our esteemed guest, uh, Professor Stephen Greenblatt. Um, he's a university professor at Harvard, which is you know, the highest honor bestowed upon a faculty. Um, <laughs> it's a big deal. Um, he, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, you were born in Newton, went to Newton Public Schools, That's right. Yale College class of 64, yeah, correct. PhD in 68. I'm not stopping you, I promise. Um, <laughs> um, but he's a scholar of Shakespeare. Um, there's a book on Shakespeare right there. Um, and it's funny because Shmuley was telling me about this too, uh, and I knew this a little bit from my mother. My mother, Tummer, really likes talking about um, famous people who are violently anti-Semitic, um, and Shakespeare was one of them, apparently. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here? Uh, we have the expert. I'm the expert. Am I wrong here? I'll give you Talmud. He'll tell you I'll be talking about it a little bit, so we'll see. Wonderful. I'm an anti-Semitic. So um, I was going to say, but... Um, Oh, Newton Public Schools, then Yale, then you were a professor at Berkeley for like 28 years. That's right. And then came to MIT. I mean, no, I came to Harvard. Harvard. <laughs> you didn't get into MIT. Charles, you didn't get into MIT. Anyway, um, I think I have a few more notes that um, I have to mention. Um, Incre I have written here as a note a lot of honors because um, I looked <laughs> on his uh, Wikipedia page and it's just like Guggenheim honor, Guggenheim fellow, genius grant, university professor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, started an entire new wave of um, type of way to think about literary career. I'm not a humanities person also. I'm very bad at, like reading is tough for me, English is hard for me. <laughs> so I might be misspeaking here, uh, but um, started a whole new wave of like type of literary criticism that's, you know, spread to other English departments throughout the country. Um, and uh, now he gets to talk to us, which is wonderful. And I'm really looking forward to that. So, uh, Professor Greenblatt. Thank you very much. I don't think I need this because I have. Thank you so much, Charles. I, I think I'm mic'd, uh, so I don't really need to have. So uh, let me join in thanking Aaron and Ilana for your hosting us this evening. And thank you to Toby and Shmuley. Thank you all. Thank you for the gracious introduction and all of you for being here. I want to talk, in fact, about this question of whether Shakespeare was a violent anti-Semite. I mean, that, uh, uh, and to, in a more general sense, to try to think about, about what we're supposed to do uh, with the inheritance, not just from Shakespeare, but the inheritance, basically, of Western culture, which is, has had, uh, as you know, uh, I'm sure, um, as a major foundational theme really going back uh, several thousand years actually um, a very strong aversion to Judaism and sort of defined itself in relation in opposition to Judaism uh, so insofar as one is in the sensitive to the culture that we live in um, whether it's um, uh, Bach uh, or uh, Shakespeare uh, or you like novels by Trollope or whatever, you actually constantly, or Dickens, you constantly encounter um, various tropes of anti-Semitism, some violent, some less violent, some merely locally obnoxious. And the, the, there is a question that I don't have a, uh, actually a, a, a clear answer to, but I, since I'm a Shakespearean and teach Shakespeare uh, uh, every, constantly every year, think about Shakespeare. I've grappled really for all my life with, with uh, what it means to engage with uh, texts uh, that have this um, deep aversion to, uh, to my identity, to who I am. And, the, and as they say, this is, uh, uh, extends way, way beyond Shakespeare went way beyond English literature. It's a theme in, in Western culture. Uh, we inherit it. Uh, so what I, is there something that I 
you were pointing. I didn't know if you, you uh, 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 I could see if I need this. <laughs> 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 Your decision is perfect, don't worry. <laughs> 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 I have a, <laughs> I, I, I simply was making a funny gesture, and I thought there's got to be something. <laughs> <laughs> I have a handout uh, for you. Uh, Is there enough for everybody? There's enough, should be enough for everybody, so it'll come back. And I want to start just by talking about, about uh, a place I, in 2014, I was invited to be the keynote uh, speaker at the first, and actually probably thanks to me, the last uh, Iranian uh, Shakespeare conference in Tehran. Uh, I, it was, I, I only, there was a sort of argument, internal argument in Tehran about wh uh, whether I could and should be invited. It was resolved, but only on the day, actually, that, that eventually I was in, uh, in Berlin and flew to Iran, but it was, I only got the visa the very day I was supposed to fly out. So it was going back and forth until that point. And I had an exceedingly interesting time, uh, and in many ways a thrilling time. It's a fascinating country, uh, and it was exciting to be there. Um, and when I came back, I mean, when I was there, my host, the one who wanted me to be there, w w was whispering to me, There's a, uh, that's the government spy there, and that's the government spy there, and so on. I mean, in the, in the audience, but there was also, I mean, it was a complicated world. When I came back, I, I made the actually serious blunder uh, of writing uh, an essay about it and publishing it in the New York Review. And I showed it actually to fr uh, an Iranian friend and others, and they, they said, no, it was fine. It was, uh, I, I, it was very complimentary uh, about the wonderful people I met, the students I met, and authentically complimentary. I loved the uh, the, the students at the university you might talk to, but it was about the fact that I gave a talk about Shakespeare, entirely about Shakespeare, and never got, as it were, out of the beyond 1614, as it were. And the, but it was about uh, Shakespeare, how Shakespeare wrote what he wrote with unusual frankness uh, about the world he lived in uh, and avoided uh, being sent to jail or having his ears cut off it, because it was a ruthlessly repressive uh, society with absolutely no freedom uh, of speech and no public sphere uh, comparable to anything that we understand. Actually, I didn't say, but it was a world far, far closer to contemporary Iran than it is to, let's say, whatever, Northern California. And, the, the, uh, and that was, without saying it, that was... Uh, the burden of my talk, and then the questions that were asked were were uh, very charged. Uh, uh, do I think that Shakespeare believed there was any way out of the of the uh, oppressive regime that that he lived in, and so forth? All of the questions were again completely about Shakespeare plays, but we all understood what we were uh, talking about. Anyway, I wrote uh, a piece which I shouldn't have. Uh, uh, written, uh, but saying how, how interesting, sophisticated, smart, and, and uh, uh, subtle the uh, students were, and, um, and also with a little bit of irony, but compliments about the country and, uh, and so forth. But the piece, unfortunately, for not so much for me, but for my uh, Iranian uh, host, the one who wanted me to come, was put immediately on the digital site of the New York Review, which I hadn't anticipated, not on the print thing. And that meant it instantly went viral. And it, it provoked an e extravagantly hostile response from the, person, the people who didn't want me to be invited in the first place. Uh, and so they launched a kind of, no, oh, to, to call it a fact would be a little uh, extravagant, but, the, <laughs> but, but a very unpleasant. I had to call the FBI. I had to speak to, I mean, there, there were a lot of things about how my family as well as I would pay for my perfidy and so forth, and I was a Mossad agent, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I give you a sample of, the, of what the, I produced in them. This is from a, something called Press TV Iran, uh, which is their... Uh, which we say the bright part of, of uh, uh, Iran, in the, of the Islamist world. Zionists have changed their names when they migrate to a Western country. 
They might be blonde, etc. Their names would be Smith, Cohen, etc. I felt like writing and saying, well, you have the right idea, but the Cohen part is a little bit off. <laughs> you must not trust Western universities because many of them, I would say, about 90% are Zionists. They have top positions at universities. I even dare to say that the university is administered by Zionists, the 98%. So before letting them into Iran, find out about Mr. Cohen from Harvard as an example. Okay. And then there were, I mean, many, many things of this kind that appeared. This is just a little potpourri, a small sample of them. Harvard and Yale and Stanford and MIT and Johns Hopkins and Georgetown universities are breeding centers of Zionists. Never trust anyone educated these hatcheries. And then they even published a poem uh, called A Ridiculous Jew. Uh, I'll give you just a sample of it. It's in extremely bad uh, rhymed couplets. Um, <laughs> Uh, a casual look at, but I couldn't write such a thing in Farsi, so I should give them sort of credit. A casual look at Greenblatt can reveal him as a man with one dimension and aggressive zeal, a wolf, a thing like a mouse, a snake in the grass, whose inner evil and venom come out, alas. A hollow man remaining faithful to his blasphemous root. That, that gets sort of interesting in terms of what is going on here. Fond of nothing but spying, a great lover of loot, envious to see how progressive Iran has become. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, ungrateful to their hospitality and kind welcome. And then this interesting move, Shakespeare sketched figures like him with magnificence, Shylock the bloodthirsty and the merchant of Venice. Yet Sh Shylock was far better than Greenblatt, who was not only ugly but superficial and flat. Okay. Um, so I actually have a reasonably thick skin and I wasn't particularly nettled by this, so I th thought the, the, the verse was very bad, but I was interested in the, I was interested in the, um, not, not altogether surprised, but interested in the um, anti-Zionism I get, but the anti-Semitism, which was also quite interesting, that was re released in this, the, 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 the blasphemous root and the lover of loot, and, the, uh, and then that turn toward uh, the Merchant of Venice, toward Shakespeare. And what's most interesting in, in this piece of doggerel versus that is the, I think, quite maybe in spite of the author, I think interesting perception that Shylock was far better than Greenblatt, which I think is true as a character. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and that the contrast is, is not only ugliness, but, but something about Shylock not being flat in the way that this person imagines me uh, to be. But the idea of, and that gets us to the question that Charles raised about what is what are we to make of the Merchant of Venice? What, what are we to make of complicated, rich, not pieces of vulgar uh, stuff like this, but complicated, interesting things like the, uh, like, uh, the Bach masses or, or uh, the Merchant of Venice, where, where we're dealing with something much richer, much more complicated, much more nuanced than, than a, you know, uh, just an explosion of anger. Um, so let's jump back to get a sense of what's going on in The Merchant of Venice. And then I'm, I won't go on too long because I really do want to open this up and have a conversation with you about this. But just to take a historical, just to put things in context, this is a, uh, a minister in the Church of England, Thomas Beard, writing in a book called The Theater of God's Judgments, 1597, which is the year that, probably the year that Shakespeare wrote Merchant of Venice, 1597. In our English chronicles are recorded many histories of the malicious practices of Jews against Christians in hatred of, Je of Christ Jesus our Savior, whom they in contempt call our crucified God. That didn't sound so contemptuous, but anyway. And especially this devilish practice was most frequent amongst them here in England, as in Germany, France, and other places where they were suffered to inhabit, namely every year to steal some Christian man's child from the parents on Good Friday to crucify him in despite of Christ and the Christian religion. So this is uh, Thomas Beard's version of the blood libel, uh, a, f a charge over which, which many, many Jews were killed, uh, in, in not, but not actually for quite a while in England, and not for quite a while in England because the Jews were expelled from England in, in 1290 uh, entirely. The entire community was, was expelled from the uh, country. It was the first mass expulsion in, of Jews in European, in fact, of any ethnicity, I think, in European history. Um, so, but, so, but the fantasy is still alive and kicking in 1597 that Jews kill Christian children uh, uh, at least once a year. Usually it's associated with, with Pesach. Um, uh, so 
it likewise, uh, I give you as a third passage, uh, actually quite interesting play by Christ Shakespeare's contemporary, exact contemporary, Christopher Marlowe, a play written uh, a little bit before Merchant of Venice, Mar uh, Marlowe, probably in about, about a decade before The Merchant of Venice was written. This is uh, from the play called The Jew of Malta. And the, the villainous anti-hero, the Jew, uh, Barabbas, says, as for myself, I walk abroad o' nights and kill sick people groaning under walls. Sometimes I go about and poison wells. So that's also, again, a, that's a, a, a very charged accusation already, again, from the 14th century, from the time of the Black Death. The Jews were poisoning wells. Being young, I studied physic and began to practice first upon the Italian. There I enriched the priests with burials. After that, I was an engineer and in the wars twixt France and Germany, under pretense of helping Charles V, slew friend and enemy with my stratagems. Then after that, I was a usurer, and with extorting, cousining, and forfeiting, and tricks belonging unto brokery, I filled the jails with bankrupts in a year, and with young orphans, planted hospitals, and so forth and so on. Um, so that's, the war that's England in the late 16th century. They're not talking about Jews that they know. There are no Jews in England, and to speak of them, we're a handful of of uh, conversos, Moranos, but, the, but that it's, has a little of the quality of the big bad wolf. I mean, Jews haven't been around for several centuries, but, they're, but, it, but it's deeper than the big bad wolf in the sense that, that it's, the, it's the way in which, in a profound way, Christian culture for a very long time, it, this is a, these are nasty versions of the way in which uh, Christian culture tried to understand itself in relation to uh, to the Jews. And I give you one other quotation from uh, 1594, uh, f which is a quote from uh, the Queen's physician, the Queen Elizabeth's physician, Rodrigo Lopez, or Lopes. Um, uh, I love the Queen as I hope to see Jesus Christ within this quarter of an hour. These are words that this man, Rodrigo Lopez, spoke on the scaffold because he was accused of trying to poison the Queen, which he certainly didn't. Uh, try to do, but in the in in the course of the trial against him, uh, the prosecutor made a big deal about the fact that his origin was Jewish. Though he, as he says here, was quite clearly uh, professing himself to be a Christian and had practiced as a Christian uh, in uh, in England. Um, he came originally from Lisbon, was a converso, probably not a Marano, probably actually a serious Christian. Um, and when he said these words on the scaffold, the entire crowd around the scaf scaffold burst into laughter uh, when they were about to see him executed. And, uh, that they thought this was ironic. He was being ironic that no Jew would, would say such a thing, that he loved the queen as, as I hope to see Jesus Christ within a quarter of an hour. They thought it was a joke. All right. Um, I gave, give you one other background quotation, which is from much earlier in the century. The Venetians... Uh, figured out a way, um, unlike the English, whom, as I say, had earlier, already in the late 13th century, expelled their Jewish population. The Venetians figured out a way that they could all more or less live together with the Jewish population, which is mainly to, um, to wall them up uh, on a little island uh, in one of the islands to cl close it up. Uh, the island that had an uh, iron foundry that was uh, the first ghetto um, um, in, in uh, Europe. Uh, and the regulation from 1516 was that the Jews must live together in the ghetto near uh, San Girolamo in order to prevent their roaming about at night. God forbid Jews should be allowed to roam around at night. Uh, actually, they made, the, I don't have it here, but they made an exception that physicians who are treating Christian patients were allowed to roam about at night and leave the ghetto, but everyone else. Let there be two gates on the side of the old ghetto where there's a little bridge. Likewise, on the other side of the bridge, which gate shall be opened in the morning and shall be closed at midnight by four Christian guards appointed and paid by the Jews at the rate deemed suitable by our cabinet and so forth. But, and this was a, a measure that actually enabled, it was on the whole, not to sound like my Aunt Rose, on the whole good for the Jews uh, because the, the Jews were able to live in... Venice, I mean, it was unpleasant, but the Jews were able to live and do business in Venice uh, f because of this regulation with relative security. I mean, uh, much less likely to be 
attacked uh, by the surrounding Christian community. It was obviously profoundly offensive, and it has a long ghetto, ghettoization has a long disagreeable uh, history, but the, the, this particular regulation uh, enabled uh, the Jewish community in Venice in a, in a certain way to thrive. As, as those of you who've been to Venice and seen the synagogues that, that uh, one can still visit there, and there's actually Chabadniks now in the, in, in the, the, that square. Uh, uh, well, you'll, you can see that there was a, actually in the 16th century a very vital uh, Jewish community. It isn't 100% clear to me, in fact, it doesn't seem to me that Shakespeare knew that there was a ghetto in Venice. There are, there are several indications in the play that he, he didn't fully take in, that the Jews uh, were not fully integrated into the, uh, into the uh, uh, Venetian city. But Shakespeare wrote a play that many of you will know. I don't expect all of you will have the, the plot absolutely at the top of your, uh, at the end of your fingers, but the, the, the basic story you will know, which is that there's a, a, um, an, a merchant named Antonio, a Christian merchant, who has all of, who's very wealthy, but all, has all of his money uh, in ventures abroad. And a friend of his named Bassanio, me loves, there's a sort of more almost explicit gay uh, subtext. The friend whom Antonio adores, Bassanio, comes and says that he wants to borrow money from Antonio in order to woo an enormously wealthy woman, and he has to be dressed properly and present himself properly and so forth. And Antonio says, I'll give you, I'll give you anything, but I'm, I don't have any ready money. Um, and... Um, but I'll go to a Jew and borrow money from, from the, uh, the Jewish usurer, uh, Shylock. Uh, and so Antonio goes to Shylock, and Shylock uh, uh, and, and offers to, uh, or, or says that he'd like to borrow money uh, from uh, Shylock. Uh, and Shylock responds um, as follows in my, my sixth passage here. Signor Antonio, many a time and oft in the Rialto, the Rialto is the bridge where commercial life centered in uh, Venice, many a time and oft in the Rialto you have raided me, raided me, uh, attacked me, criticized me, about my monies and my usances. Still have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spit upon my Jewish gabardine, and all for use of that which is mine own. Well then, it now appears you need my help. Go to then. You come to me and you say, Shylock, we would have monies. You say so, you that did void your room upon my beard and foot me as you spurn a stranger cur over your threshold. Monies is your suit. What should I say to you? Should I not say, have a dog money? Is it possible a cur can lend 3,000 ducats or... Shall I bend low and in a bondman's key, with bated breath and whispering humbleness, say this? Oh, fair sir, you spit upon me Wednesday last. You spurned me such a day. Another time you called me dog. And for these courtesies, I'll lend you thus much monies? And Antonio replies, as you can see, I must like to call thee so again. To spit on thee again, to spurn thee too. If thou wilt lend this money, lend it not as to thy friends, for when did friendship take a breed for barren metal of his friend, but lend it rather to thine enemy? And in response to this, Shylock says, well, I really wasn't, didn't mean to have a fight with you. I mean, I, 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 I'll loan you the money. Let's just, I, I, let's have a, a merry bond, he says, a, just as a kind of joke, that, that if you don't pay me back in time, uh, you, will, you owe me a pound of your flesh, cut off from wherever I choose from your body. And then you will remember all of the play, which is that he, the, the ships that he expects confidently to come in don't come in, um, and the, the time of the bond expiring approaches. No one thinks that Shylock w will actually take a pound of Antonio's flesh, uh, but in the meantime, uh, Antonio's beloved daughter Jessica has eloped with a Christian and stolen much of Shylock's money, uh, and um, and uh, uh, profoundly, obviously, hurt him. Um, and uh, he uh, in a is in a rage and 
says that he insists on taking the pound of flesh, which is his legal right uh, because of the bond. Uh, and then in a sort of climactic trial scene, it's all cleverly resolved uh, in a way I could explain to you, but I, it's not, not particularly relevant to this, uh, uh, to what I have to say right now. Um, what is perhaps relevant to what I have to say right now is that two things. First of all, that Shylock has a very interesting passage that's not often noticed, uh, but uh, when, he's, when, he's at, when Antonio asks for the 3,000 ducats, Shylock says, I'm debating at my present store. That's how much money I have in my, in my house. And by the near guess of my memory, I cannot instantly raise up the gross of full 3,000 ducats. Well, what of that? Tubal, a wealthy Hebrew of my tribe, will furnish me. It's a, some obscure detail, and it's very little commented on, but it's interesting to me because why, why did Shakespeare go out of his way to have, I mean, Shiloh could have just come up with the 3,000 ducats. What is that? I mean, so it must be that the, it's not just his money, but Jewish money that's somehow involved in this, the Jewish community's money, Tubal's money. I mean, that, that's interesting, actually, in terms of it's not, that somehow involved in this is not simply uh, one Jewish usurer, and by the way, the, it, there's been a huge amount of work that's done on, on uh, money lending in, uh, in Venice. The J Jewish money lenders, the, the, it's a, were, for the most part, were, were pawnbrokers, and they were, we're talking about you know, loans of the equivalent of five or ten dollars, not the equivalent of 3,000 ducats. It's, this is a kind of completely, as part of a kind of fantastical idea that Jews have gigantic they're all Rothschilds with gigantic uh, amounts of money. But anyway, um, and then um, in the, as the trial scene approaches and various people go to Shylock and say, friends of Antonio, you're, you're not really going to do this. and you, It's insane to do this. You, you mustn't do this. It's in, inhumane and so forth and so on. Shylock gives a famous speech, which I also gave you here. Um, he hath disgraced me hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heeded my enemies. And what's his reason? I'm a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we're like you in the rest, we'll resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what's his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why revenge? The villainy you teach me, I will execute. And it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. So. Uh, that is, is uh, Shylock's intention, uh, but he wants to do this, he wants to do his, uh, he want, clearly wants to kill Antonio, but he wants to do it legally because he has the right to do it with the contract. And when, it, when it's, when a, through a clever legal device, it is uh, shown to him that he's only entitled to take flesh but not any blood and therefore he'll have committed a, a, a crime and he, will, he could take, he'll be executed. Uh, he agrees that the, as you may remember, to convert as part of a plea bargain, he can, agrees to convert to Christianity and give all of his money to uh, his daughter and, and uh, her Christian husband, uh, keeping a, a little bit during his own lifetime. And that's the, he disappears from the fifth act of the play. All right, so the question is, um, and it's a question that I, it's a wonderful play that I ask myself a lot, um, is what, what does it matter that Shylock is not simply a kind of pasteboard villain uh, twirling his mustaches and, and uh, uh, prancing around the stage? What is it, what, what is the, what are we to do with the fact, what is the interest uh, and how do we process the fact that this play is 
whether it's violently anti-Semitic, because it actually doesn't wind up killing Shylock, it, it winds up just converting him, which from a Christian point of view is a gift, not a punishment. Uh, so in that sense, it's not, I mean, there are plenty of plays. Uh, Bar Barabbas in Jew of Malta is boiled in oil at the end of the play. Well, being, be, turning, becoming Christian is, we could say, a, a gentler uh, end uh, for, for Shylock. But the interesting question, and it's a question that, that I would say haunts the human, not just me, Shakespeare classes and so forth, but haunts the, the inheritance that we have, cultural inheritance that we have. Uh, it, this happens to be the one the Jews, like myself, worry about, but other groups worry about their own insults, as it were. What do we do with this? Do we, do we continue to teach the Merchant of Venice in high schools, which, where it was routinely taught? Uh, should it be performed? Uh, what is our relationship to it? What is our relationship to it, uh, 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 whether we're Jews or not Jews? Uh, and particularly, what is our relationship to it at this moment when, when, uh, when anti-Semitism is manifestly on uh, a resurgence? Uh, and uh, what are we meant to, uh, how are we meant to process this if we, if we process it at all? Should we s suppress this? Uh, play and other plays like it. I mean this as a serious uh, uh, question to ask all of you, uh, and because my, I have my own experience and my own opinion about this. I mean, but I'm in the business, as it were. I'm I'm uh, a a Shakespearean, and I've uh, thought about this play and the other. Uh, place that he wrote all my life, and I know something about the world in which they were produced. But, but uh, most of the people who encounter this play in the theater or, uh, or uh, in school don't have that uh, access. So the question is what, uh, and I, I mean really to throw it open to us and have a conversation about it, what, what, what do we think? Um, what do we think that, that we're to do with this poisoned gift? Uh, of um, it's, it, I, I haven't been able to convey to you how beautiful this play is. It's a fantastically beautiful play, beautifully constructed, elegantly done, so rich and complex, uh, so uh, uh, very, very funny at, at moments and also painful and poignant at others. Yeah. A question I have is what Shakespeare's attitude towards other Yes, that's a very interesting question. I mean, he, he, uh, what are you looking for? for the mic. Oh. Is that? That's not it. That's a mic. Oh, that's a mic. I'm sorry. So the, the question is, is, uh, how do other creeds, uh, appear, function, uh, in Shakespeare's plays? And, I mean, the answer, broadly speaking, is first of all, the plays are f full of the usual English despising of the French. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, also sort of funny about the, not, uh, about the Welsh and the Scots uh, as well. Uh, it, the, the plays, it, 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 I could have given this uh, talk about Othello and Titus Andronicus, uh, uh, two, two plays in which there are, are uh, fascinating but extremely disturbing black characters. Um, so yes, there are other groups that I mean, the, the cultures define themselves by who they're not as well as by uh, whom they are. So uh, Shakespeare is not a, uh, does not preach universal love with the exception of the Jews. He, ha he, he has a, you know, sort of the usual more nuanced uh, account that we all have about, uh, 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 you know, I give my parents more credit maybe than they deserve for this, but they're all their complicated feelings about the difference between Litvaks and Galicianas uh, and, uh, and Russishas. I mean, they had very complicated sense of where, even within our own tribe, of who everyone was and, the, and, and what their qualities were. So Shakespeare has an appropriately rich sense of differences among 
uh, peoples. But the, 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 but the, and the Merchant of Venice is not the only play in which Jews appear, but it's the one that, in which there's a, the fullest uh, appearance of, in this case, the sort of villainous Jew, Jew filled with rage. But filled with rage, as we saw, filled with rage, as it were, for a reason. I mean, they, they say it, uh, it doesn't make the rage, the desire to kill Antonio more attractive, but the, it, it makes it more explicable that Shakespeare gives him a quite, I think, remarkable account of why he feels this way uh, about uh, Antonio. Yeah. So I, I'm really curious, as you're teaching this, um, so we're just going to ask you to raise your hand, and then we'll pass the mic back. Sorry. I'm, I'm very curious as you're teaching this. I noticed you gave us so much important context, a historical context, sort of um, cultural context, uh, which is very helpful in kind of reorientation. And yet I think about what does that do for an, a level of accountability when we're reading it? Yeah. And so if I were to come back to The Merchant of Venice, having not read it for several years, Without the context, I think I may have been more um, appalled, right? But with the context, it feels like, oh, of course, he was writing out of his time. Um, and so I worry it mitigates the accountability. So I'm curious how you weigh those two when you're yeah, teaching. Yeah, no, it's a, I mean, you speak directly to, to, as it were, my life in the sense that that of, I'm in the position in which because of whom I'm teaching and and uh, the, and what I actually have spent my life trying to understand, I'm in a position to say all kinds of nuanced things about about why this is given compared with Thomas Beard or with Marlowe. Why this is actually a remarkably um, uh, uh, a remarkably sensitive account of of Jewish villainy, an unusually uh, rich and mm -hmm. and uh, alert sense of, of this. If, the funny thing about Shakespeare particularly, uh, Shakespeare is still alive uh, as a, in, in popular culture, uh, as your question suggests. So that, that it, it, many, many, most people who encounter Shakespeare don't encounter him if they would if I, in my classroom, let's say, or if they watched the MOOC that I once made on this, but, but uh, encounter him. In, in a high school classroom or in, a, in, a, in the theater and more or less, you know, sort of uh, in whatever production they see. Some are, some are much more nuanced than other productions. And there was, I have a, a Swedish friend, a theater friend, who actually did a sociological experiment of a questionnaire of a, for a Swedish production uh, of Merchant of Venice before and after the mm. play asking people what their opinions of Jews were. And yeah, not surprisingly, their opinions of Jews got, went down in the, after they saw the play. So, I mean, that, that isn't so startling. I mean, the, uh, because precisely it's very hard to qualify these things or, or explain these things. And I, I have the last passage on here uh, that I gave you is, is a uh, rather, or two last passages, rather curious footnote to, we almost nothing survives of a personal kind from in in uh, from, from Shakespeare's career. People didn't collect data, uh, information of this kind and save it. But there are a, a group of letters from 1598 uh, that uh, from Stratford uh, neighbors of Shakespeare's. Uh, the, he knew the Quinies all his life from the Sturleys. Um, Shakespeare came from Stratford upon Avon in Warwickshire. So Adrian Quiney writes to Richard Quiney uh, uh, in October 1598, if you bargain, I gave you in the original spelling, but if you bargain with William Shakespeare or recover money, therefore, bring your money home. And then later in the month, Richard Quiney writes to Shakespeare, to my loving good friend and countryman, Mr. William Shakespeare, who shall friend me much in helping me out of all the debts I owe in London, I thank God and much quiet my mind. And then Abraham Sturley writes to Richard Quiney the next month, our country and Mr. William Shakespeare would procure us money, which I will like of, as I shall hear when, where, and how. <coughs> What's the point? Shakespeare was a money lender. Shakespeare was, was, was loaning money at interest. Uh, the, Shakespeare is Shylock. That, that, uh, and this is 1598. This is the, probably the year after he wrote Merchant of Venice. Uh, 
uh, merchant of Venice is being performed at this point. Mm. So what does that mean? Mm. What do we do with that? Uh, Shakespeare, Shakespeare is, there are no Jews in England loaning money or not loaning money in 1598, but William Shakespeare of Stratford had made money in the theater, and he's in the business of money lending. And, and people are writing back and forth to each other, saying, you have to, let's see what we can get from Shakespeare. Uh, let's see how much he's going to charge us uh, for the money. Uh, so that, we could say, helps to explain why Shakespeare gives a rather un, un, unusually complicated account of, of Shylock, even though it's also an anti, well, anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish account. I mean, it's not quite clear that, that, uh, that, it's not clear that Shakespeare thought that about Semites as a category, um, though it's possible. And, and in fact, that's why I put the last passage here. There's a moment in, at the, in the trial scene in Act Four of, of The Merchant of Venice in which um, a character who's the judge, uh, or is, is dressed up as the judge, comes in and looks around the courtroom and says, which is the merchant here and which is the Jew? Uh, but they're, they're not, it, that's either, well, we don't know because there's no record of how it was performed. Either they're indistinguishable and there was the, 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 the company was not actually depicting Shylock with a big nose and a red uh, wig, or it was meant to arouse laughter that the judge maybe was nearsighted and couldn't see who was the obvious Jew and who was the ob- we don't know. But that's a very strange line, which is the merchant here and which is the Jew. Uh, it allows, as usual with Shakespeare, uh, more than one interpretation depending on how the, the actors want to do it. Uh, but yeah, please. You want to pass it? To, yeah. Here, I'll, I'll pass it down to you. Thank you. Here you go. Sorry. Thank you so much. Um, I, I definitely, of course, agree that um, teaching the context around a play, um, around anything, changes how it's received and can um, moderate or mitigate or even maybe eliminate kind of the effect it might have on a person's perception, in this case, um, of, of a Jewish person or Jews. Um, it, it seemed to me, as you were describing the complexity that Shakespeare gives Shylock, that you were headed, that you that you were implying that um, that complexity, that subtlety, um, also diminishes, I guess, the the force or the um, dangerousness of of the anti-Semitism as it appears in the play. But I wonder if, because the play is not a caricature, and therefore we kind of see Shylock as an authentic person that we can recognize and empathize with that because he is ultimately this really evil figure that it is a more sinister and dangerous thing because it's not absurd and ridiculous and the thrust of that is not I don't think it should be taught but I, I wonder if the complexity is yeah no I, I, I that's precisely what I'm asking myself I mean that if, I, I didn't say much about Marlowe's uh, marvelous grotesque uh, play The Jew of Malta, but the, uh, I just gave you a little passage from it. But Marlowe's point in The Jew of Malta, the Jew, Barabbas in The Jew of Malta, is a, a, has no, uh, the, none of this subtle n- nuance. He's a grotesque villain. I mean, poisons wells and blah, blah, blah. He's actually telling this to his Muslim sidekick, too. I mean, they're, they're, they're going to be in cahoots together. But the whole point of Marlowe's play is that actually the Christians are even worse. Uh, and so it's a kind of internal joke. Marlowe is a very weird character. I mean, that, that, and so it, it, in that case, having the extreme uh, uh, stereotypic villain is part of a strategy to actually turn it on the Christians, not to turn it against the Jews. And you, you could easily say, I think, that something like the reverse is true in, in The Merchant of Venice, that, that somehow understanding that there is cause for Shylock to be the twisted, uh, homicidal person he is in, in, by Act Four, uh, actually makes us, should make you think we better be careful about these people. We've hurt them so much that they're, there's, they're, there's, we better just get rid of them. There's no forgiveness that way. Either convert them or get rid of them, keep them away forever. I mean, it's possible, I think. I think that I think it's. I don't think that that. 
I, I, I don't think that the complexity of characterization is itself um, a mitigation uh, of, of Jew hatred in this case. Or if, I, I think it, 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 it's an interesting phenomenon, a fascinating phenomenon. And, and likewise, I think there's a deep aesthetic question for the likes of me to spend my life thinking about these things. I mean, it's a beautiful play, really beautiful play. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's not, it's performed after 400 years, not because people are, a lot of other Shakespeare plays aren't performed, uh, but this one is because it, it's actually a fabulously well-made work of art. But does that mitigate anything? I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a, I don't know what, I, I, instead of getting clarity as I reach old age, I get more, Puzzled by, uh, by this. I went. I had a. I got an honorary degree from the University of Alicante in in Spain, and they gave me a weird little hat and I and white gloves, and I danced around uh, for them. And the and then when I was leaving, uh, my host who was tremendously nice. Gave me a very beautiful picture book of a of something called the the uh, Mystery of Elche, which is a uh, annual celebration in the next town from Alicante, a town called Elche, a mystery play that's been performed uninterruptedly for, for the last 400 years. Uh, and it's the, even the medieval music survives for it. And he said, I must come back and see it. And I looked at the book, and I did want to go back and see it, but for reasons other than he, he maybe anticipated. I wanted to go back because I noticed immediately when I opened the thing that some of the performers in, the, in this ritual play uh, were wearing talit. I thought, oh. Uh, and so I went to see the performance uh, two years later. Um, and it is, of course, a, just, it's a stunningly beautiful. And you, it's a world, Her UNESCO world cultural event now. UNESCO has a cate category of world events and culture. It's startlingly anti Semitic. Uh, and the whole community, the whole town of Elche comes together. It's very beautiful. Um, it, the music is fantastic, and it involves a group of rabid Jews trying to attack the body of the Virgin, and then being paralyzed when they get near her body, and converting, of course, and so forth. But the, uh, uh, some, the, my host from Elche I, uh, uh, asked me afterwards, you know, what I thought of it, I said I was incredibly moved by it. It was so beautiful. Everyone was sobbing, and, and, uh, but I said I found it very disturbing. And he said, really? What, what was disturbing about it? I said, well, what would you feel if you, if you how would you feel if you were in Baghdad and saw uh, you know, some kind of ritualized celebration about rabid Christians? I mean, uh, oh, he thought about it. Yeah, I might feel uncomfortable, he said. <laughs> I, in this case, I, I, and maybe this is part of an answer, I, I, th I think I see what to do with the mystery of Elche, which is not to get rid of it, but to make sure that the, that the, that the apostles and that the virgin also look like Jews. Because the mistake or the offensiveness of the, to me, profound offensiveness of the performance was the, and I think it has to do with, with new Christians, old Christians, with 16th century issues that the Spanish have never resolved. The mistake is to, to set something about the Virgin uh, and Jesus in the ancient world and have, only, have the Virgin look like a Christian and all the apostles look like Christians, but to have the Jews look like Jews. Come on, guys. I mean, they're all Jews at that point. <laughs> and then, you, then you know, you would, it wouldn't make it, it, wouldn't make it pro Semitic. It just wouldn't make it so loathsomely offensive. I mean, that uh, you, would, you would have a kind of historical understanding of you know, what that moment was. And something of the same thing could be said about the Merchant of Venice. It doesn't, you can never get rid of the anti Semitism in the Merchant of Venice. It's there, it's part of its DNA. But you can perform it in ways that, that uh, bring out the sheer uncomfortableness of it all. Uncomfortable for everyone, for Portia as well as for Shylock. Yeah, over here. It seems to me that plays such as The Merchant of Venice are performed regularly and they're admired. Yeah. But there's no objection to it. I mean, we talk about protesting in the streets, the most trivial things, but 
we continue to watch The Merchant of Venice. It is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, and I was, uh, my, my daughter went to a camp. She's a little, uh, she's a teenager. And the, the attendees were almost all children of New York City people, and most of them were Jews. So they came to uh, upper state, upstate New York, and they sent their kids to a, a camp. And what did they put on for the, the, the play for that year? Jesus Christ Superstar. <laughs> and if there's anything more anti-Semitic than Jesus Christ Superstar, I'm not sure I know what it is. <laughs> it was virulently, they portrayed the high priests of the Jews in these cloaks and ogres. Yeah. So people watch these things and they never object to them. Yeah. So well, that's I, a question whether I, the question, I, one question I raised, I mean, there are, Jews, of course, have objected to the merchant. I mean, there's a Jewish community is often split locally about whether whether the play should be performed. It's not universally accepted by Jewish communities. I mean, and I understand why. Well, it's accepted by the public. But, but yeah. But so one thing that comes clear, through clearly to me is the eternal, the eternalness of anti-Semitism. No matter what you do, no matter what era you're in, there is a vestige of anti-Semitism that's never objected to by the population. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I read Ivanhoe. Yes. Scott. Yeah, yeah. And of course, there's Rebecca and her father, whose name I don't remember, but they were not really maligned, but they were certainly set aside. Yes. And Ivanhoe wouldn't dream of yes. befriending her or romancing her. And that was a, a, another dash of anti-Semitism. It's yeah. everywhere, and it's been that way my whole life. Yes. And I'm sure yours. Yes. yes. And um, it doesn't go away. And whether you argue about the Virgin of Venice and Shylock, and it's going to be here. Yes. Well, we're long gone. No, I mean that we could take this in either take your remark in either direction. I mean, one would be uh, to say, well, you could throw up your hands in despair. Uh, about this and say that it's just, as they say, it's part of the constitutive nature of the culture. Or you can, uh, it's a funny thing to say, but I remember reading it for the first time, reading the play for the first time, I think at Yale as an undergraduate, and not f I feeling, oh my goodness, I mean, you know, that, that uh, feeling the f what the play was telling me. But at the same time, I can't fully explain this, but feeling empowered, feeling I'm not unstrung by this. I can own this thing. I can. I don't mean that I accept its account. I'm a Jew. I mean that hath not a Jew eyes. I mean that that I I see what I see, but I'm not victimized by this. I'll, I'll own this thing. I will. I will understand this. I will make this mine. Not in the sense of accepting its values, but I don't have to be. Now, I'm not sure I could still feel this way, but I remember, I remember vividly feeling a kind of, I can't, I'm not sure as I say I can fully account uh, for the feeling, but I'm not going to be, I'm not going to run away from this. I'm not going to only work on, on things more comfortable for me. This can be, uh, this can be my field. I can... Uh, I remember hearing my teacher, I went to, to did, did work after Yale yeah, in Cambridge University in England, and I remember this very brilliant old biddy named, named Muriel Bradbrook uh, saying, there are people who study Shakespeare whose grandparents didn't even speak English. Yeah, like mine. I mean, that, that, yeah. but I had a kind of fuck you feeling about it. I mean, you know, well, I mean, that to say, I didn't feel that I was, that I was, uh, you know, that I was on the wrong side of this. And that's partly the mood of the 60s and 70s. I, I mean, that, that I just, you know, my, I, didn't, uh, I, I didn't want to feel victimized by Western culture, that I'm always, you know, sort of walking with, a, with this as a burden. I feel, on the contrary, this is, I, I possess this thing. And that doesn't mean I, 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 doesn't mean I endorse it. And even accepting it is not quite right, but I don't want it erased. I want to understand it. I want to in, enjoy what I can enjoy from it. I want to know why it took this form. Uh, you want to fight it? Well, what would it mean to fight it is the question. What does it mean well, to fight this, to say, don't do it anymore? Well, 
to point out the negative aspects. Well, of point out, of course, yes, of that I do as a teacher. But that doesn't, as your remark suggested, that doesn't do away with the work. The work exists. If the people who go to, to see them, the Al Pacino version of this very good movie of it uh, are, aren't, aren't, aren't actually taking a course on Shakespeare. They're just seeing this movie. Uh, you didn't like Al Pacino. I wasn't crazy about that. There's a, I think there's a great, I think it's fine. There's a very great, if you want, there's a very great film of the Henry Goodman production, the Royal Shakespeare Company production, that is actually, I think, a much richer account. Although the Henry, the, the Al Pacino one had great stuff in it. I mean, I thought, I that, read yeah. The Al Pacino one had the, I think it was Jeremy Irons maybe playing uh, Antonio, and I thought he was tremendous. Um, I thought Al Pacino was, as usual, a little over the top. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm going to pass the mic back. Uh, thank you so much um, for coming to speak to us. I guess to something that you spoke about, like most of our ex of American exposure to Shakespeare comes early on, right? Like in the kind of K through 12 education system, and so not everyone gets access right. to the kind of context to the kind of explanation that you give to us to get that right. you might give to your students and so you know without answering the question of whether or not we should accept kind of the anti-semitism that's present here and how we should couch it how are you thinking about how we should be teaching Shakespeare how we should how how we should be teaching how to teach mm -hmm. Shakespeare in the kind of younger years context where most Americans, unlike, you know, like Confederate monuments, right, where they can put up a plaque and if you go see the monument, you have to see the plaque, people can get access to this on their own or with teachers that are under-supported, under-resourced. So what is the solution in your mind? Yeah, there's no magic solution, but it's a wonderful question. And I, I mentioned in passing that I've done an, a MOOC uh, on, on about Othello and the Merchant of Venice, uh, about you know, to, for meant for high school teachers to try to um, you know not doesn't have to be a super complicated account, but to give a a reasonable account of what the cultural uh, setting for this is, and what the also not just what the not to excuse it, but actually on the contrary to say there are serious consequences to this kind of, of to, to this long tradition. I mean, you have to understand where this winds up, I mean, uh, uh, as well. It's not just, to, to, to understand, uh, you know, what the world in which this was produced is not to forgive these values. It's to actually try to uh, understand what the meaning of this tradition is, what it connects to, where, where it went, who, who, who was profiting from this uh, set of, Attitudes and values and so forth. So, but I have, I've done that, and and also, I mean, in my own little bit. I mean that that the edition of Shakespeare that I added has a quite full account of what the uh, what the price is being paid uh, for for this kind of entertainment, and uh, you know that uh, uh, I'm not alone in this. That that I think that the only thing I can think to say is that that. Um, the more teachers understand what it, the material that they're dealing with, the less toxic it's likely to be in the classroom. But there's always going to be a certain amount of toxicity, I think. It's a, it's a, a very interesting question. And once you're out of the immediate Anglo-American context, you're in a you know, wild west of you know, people. I don't know how people are processing this. I now, many years ago, gave lectures in China, and it turned out that the play that, the Shakespeare play that most of my students in China had read was The Merchant of Venice. I thought, wow, really? Not Hamlet? I mean, that, that no, The Merchant of Venice was a kind of standard school text in China. This was a long time ago in the, in the 1980s, but, the, uh, but the, my, my students had all read Merchant of Venice, and they had suitably wacky ideas about Jews. <laughs> And as a quick follow-up, do you think that if you make the kind of resources and support accessible for teachers across the country, do you still have faith that they will kind of take that goal seriously? Or, I mean, there's all this kind of information now of, like, teachers also similarly being divided on, like, kind of polarization in the country, anti-Semitism yes. kind of rearing its yes. head yes. again. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I don't have much faith in anything. I mean, but I, I have, uh, I have some sense. 
Would I have imagined that a, would I ever really have imagined that a, 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 an ex-president who actually has a, a real political career would sit down with a Holocaust denier for, for dinner? No, it just seems inconceivable to me. Uh, I mean, unbelievable. So I, I, I don't know where any of that stuff is going in our culture. I totally agree that the, with the thing, the anti-Semitism that we thought had disappeared or that a nail had been driven into the coffin is you know, around now. That's completely weird. I mean, but it goes with a lot of other disturbing stuff that floats around. So I don't imagine it's going to go away. I imagine that it will re require um, constant engagement. But I, uh, I'm, I'm reluctant to think that the solution, I hate the personally, the impulse to try to clean it all up and get every, get rid of all of this stuff. I mean, it's, you don't actually, be, for reasons that you've already articulated, that is not focused on Jews for the most part, anti-Semitic stuff. You started to do that, you get rid of most of English literature. But the, the, but the, but with, with uh, you know, the impulse to, to tear down all the statues, not to teach anything, to get hysterical, not to be able to, to read Huck Finn and so forth and so on. I'm, com I'm of the wrong generation. I'm completely against doing that. And I actually printed up uh, for this purpose a passage from, if I can ha find it still, uh, that I came across from Toni Morrison um, about comparable issues in her world. Um, She's writing that in 1963, when the NAACP uh, had its annual national convention in Chicago, one of the organization's demands was the removal of two statuettes of black jockeys standing in the, in the lobby. The hotel management reluctantly agreed, but before the statuettes could be temporarily removed, they were draped with sheets. Their eyes were veiled, the jaunty caps were shrouded, those sassy hip twists hidden. No longer would those baleful faces offend the sensibilities of blacks or encourage the contempt of whites. Of the black people who learned of that incident, some of us were pleased by the NAC's position and the implications of its demand. Some of us were amused, others startled. What on earth did little statues of black jockeys have to do with civil rights movement? Had those of us who admired them or indifferent to them betrayed our cause? If so, there were a host of other betrayals we were guilty of. We had laughed ourselves to tears, for example, watching the Amos and Andy show on television. Uh, yet, like the jockeys, uh, in the hotel, they disappeared at the insistence of knowledgeable Negroes who represented us out in the, black, in the white world. Uh, I loved little black Sambo as a child, she writes. Uh, I found it joyful. Uh, that was now nothing less than treason and so forth. I mean, I, I'm with Toni Morrison on this one. I think it's, uh, you know, that it's a, we go down a, the, a, the wrong place if we think that the way to deal with these things is just to get rid of them. I understand why the black jockeys, which you still see around, are so disgusting and offensive. But that, I mean, I'm in favor of making these things as much of a teaching moment as you possibly can. But the question, is your, as your remark suggests, is how do you teach the teachers to make them a teaching moment? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor. Um, last year, I, I heard about a, actually what was going to be a planned local performance in the area of um, Box uh, Saint John Passion, which is a, a magnificent piece. It's yeah. also highly anti-Semitic, and I think yes. you alluded to Barabbas, blames Barabbas. the, <laughs> the moment crucifixion, of, right? Yeah. And it blames the Jews for the, the crucifixion, yeah. essentially. Um, and I was more offended by the cancellation of this, and, and by the, the implicit suggestion that Jews who might come would would not be able to take the offensiveness the offensiveness of the content or appreciate. The, the masterfulness of, of the art itself. Um, and, and so I wanted to ask, is it, is it selfish to ask, as a Jew who loves Shakespeare and loves this play and, and loves uh, uh, St. John Passion and loves the operas of Wagner, is it selfish to want to enjoy these works, not merely as teaching moments and not as educational tools, but as great works of art, despite the anti-Semitism that they contain? I mean, that certainly would describe, um, selfish is an interesting word to, to, to characterize that. I mean, and would be worth unpacking why you would think it would be selfish. But, but uh, I, I, I think I understand 
but anyway, if you are selfish, so am I on, on, on this one. Though I think Wagner was an idiot, I mean, and on anything that he, on any, anything he thought about, but it was an unbelievable genius, musical genius. And the, 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 the gap between his you know, moronic ideas and, and his artistic genius is, is fascinating to, to me. Um, but I don't think that is the case, by the way, with Shakespeare, where I think there's a much, you know, I don't think, I think there's just, there's a grappling, it's the best he could with the culture that he was living in, using its materials. Shakespeare loved to use whatever was, he thought, whatever had the most sort of blood in the, in the vein, and the, or the artery, and so if it was blacks or, or Jews, or he had a good eye for what was going to disturb people for the next few hundred years. Up, <laughs> uppity women, gays, I mean, anything. He just knows that it's there. <laughs> you, had, you had a question. I mean, when, when, um, when, uh, 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 when I think about, you know, growing up in America and being a Jew and being very proud of being Jewish and thinking about Jonas Salk and the Guggenheims and all these philanthropists, I, I, you know, I think, you know, a lot of times Jews are depicted as heroes, and why, why can't there also be a Jewish villain? You know, if we want to be fully human, if we want to bleed when we're pricked and so on, then I think we also need to have our measure of villains represented. And maybe in Shakespeare's time, you know, that was a kind of monolithic depiction of Jew as a villain, but maybe, maybe now we, you know, we, we see Jews as either, um, you know, the heroes of many stories yes. or, or sometimes as sympathetic yes. victims, but we also maybe yes. need to be villains sometimes. Yes. And, you know, yeah. maybe as Jews in a Christian society and, and knowing all this history, maybe there is a little bit of Shylock in some of us and, and maybe even a little bit of instruction in, in his resentments and what it leads to. So yeah. maybe maybe we yes. need it at, 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 at some point. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, that's a fascinating remark. I mean, it was. It, I mean, it's, as you probably know, it was, uh, there was a substantial fight on precisely these issues in the in the Yiddish-speaking Jewish community in the uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century in America about how whether to be able to represent whether you could represent Jewish villainy on stage, and and there was a um, Jacob Gordon, among other people, thought yes, you absolutely had to represent. Uh, Jewish villainy as well as Jewish heroism. In the case of Shakespeare, by the way, and the, I, I, as I didn't say, and, but probably relevant, a lot of what is going on, this is not, it's not in relation to real Jews in, this, this, in his case, but a lot of what's going on has to do with, of course, the extraordinary problem of the fact that their heroes are all Jews. That they happen to be called Christians, but I mean that they, they knew they, in some sense, they knew perfectly well that Jesus was, because he's called a rabbi in the, uh, in the New Testament, and the, uh, they had this problem that they had this whole pantheon of absolute heroes, uh, and they, they needed to sort of figure out uh, how to differentiate them from, from the very thing that they were. And they, I mean, the results are unpleasant, I mean, but the, the, it, it has to do, there's a curious way in which it's not, I say that because, Dick, as you probably know, Dickens, when, when he was criticized for Fagin, was a loathsome anti-Semitic stereotype, he tried to make up for it by writing another novel with a good Jew, but the good Jew is a sort of tedious character, not the least bit interesting, <laughs> I mean, the, Fagin is really exciting as a character, and it's very hard to depict Jewish heroism, uh, I think, easier to depict Jewish villainy, but the, in, a, in a fictional world. Um, but it happens. I mean, and, uh, and in the case of, of the long history of Christianity, it was the tremendous dif difficulty of figuring out how to get out of the heroizing of, of the Jews collectively by, off, by othering them and celebrating those Jews called Christians. Uh, in the uh, and making sure that no one confused the two. Did Shakespeare have any heroic Jews? No. <laughs> no. no. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Pass the mic. <laughs> yeah. So, uh... Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, something I, I wonder about, what do the most thoughtful uh, productions of uh, The Merchant of Venice that you've seen do with this character? How do they, how do they present them? Is he very, you know, is he very, like, uh, visibly, you know, 
uh, meant to embody a Jewish figure? Is he more uh, like the others? And how do they uh, how do they navigate it? One thing that's almost always done now uh, it's become a kind of trope in, in productions of the play is not with Shylock but with his daughter. Uh, in the, Shylock disappears at the end of Act Four. He says he he agrees to convert. And he says, he's, it's a very remarkable end of the thing. He says, I just, I'm not feeling well. He has to leave the court just as he's feeling sick. Um, but, and he doesn't appear again in Act Five. So the general presumption, I mean, that, that, and Shakespeare doesn't explain what happened to him. But what's done now, almost invariably, is that there's a, a, a Kaddish where you see uh, Jessica suffering in some, there's no evidence for it in the text, but that, that, that Jessica feels you know, terrible about what's happened to her father. And she's, you know, often it's accompanied by <clears throat> uh, some vague sense that she isn't being fully accepted into the Venetian world, that she's Christian world that she's entered. So that the, the play, most productions now suggest in some way or other a little, um, difficulty in the fantasy of absorption. The play means, as I say, the play, as I said, in a kind of weird way, means to be generous, because it's not, after all, saying we can't absorb Jews. We just have to become Christians, and then we're not going to worry about, about this uh, anymore. And the, in the best productions that I've seen, I mentioned that one, the, uh, I think one Royal Shakespeare Company, wonderful one, Henry Goodman one, you realize that everyone is in a rotten position that the trouble with being an anti-Semite is that's also rotten as a position, the, that no one is comfortable doing these things, but they're stuck in it. Um, Portia's as stuck in it as, as uh, Shylock is, and they can't figure out a way out of it. Um, and the, uh, it, it, uh, I think, actually, from my way of thinking, the most successful way of dealing with it is opposed to trying to, to uh, whitewash it. Hi, thanks. Do you think in terms of the consumption of anti-Semitic art or art by anti-Semites, same for, for racist or transphobic art, that it matters that Shakespeare has been dead 500 years, whereas con the consumption of art by living artists, that's, that's money in their pockets, that's perhaps the endorsement of the creation of more art, even if it's like more subtle it, within the greater work itself, um, um, or not part of the work, if it's if it's the person and not necessarily obvious mm. in the work, um, if, if there's a difference there. I mean, I'm I, I'm thinking about the implications of your question. So, the a contemporary. I'm trying to think of who the contemporary anti-Semitic artist would be. I'm mean, Kanye West, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> think of, but the, yeah. but I if, if I download a Kanye West song, goblins and Harry Potter, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the Goblins and Harry Potter are interesting in relation to Wagner, is it? I mean, the, the case because that just seems like a tr thing to be lifted out of, out of Wagner, uh, and it's not. She doesn't say they're Jewish, right? I mean, they're just no, they're, they're, they're kind of greedy. That's all. Uh, yeah. They're the bankers. Yeah. They're bankers with long noses. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to think. Does it make? I mean, I would. Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, uh, I, I, my parents wouldn't have bought a German car, um, but I, you know, I bought one without feeling much of anything. I mean, that that uh, <laughs> uncomfortable. But you know, I get that's a that to be sure is a is a more distant. I mean, I don't have anything against Germans now. I mean, that it, it, it didn't live through that. Um, I now own a Tesla. Do I worry about Elon Musk's uh, <laughs> feelings about these things? Uh, should I? I mean, I mean it seriously. Would you? Uh, would you think that 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 creep? I shouldn't give my money to that, that creep. I, I would. I, I, like I wouldn't buy a Tesla. Right. Yeah. 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 So I don't know. I mean, I think these are kind of moral decisions that that probably each of us makes individually. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I have a question. I'm just curious about um, George. 
So at what point is it found that Shakespeare was a moneylender? Is this before he wrote The Merchant of Venice? Because, you know, Christians weren't allowed to be moneylenders, which is why this, the trope, the stereotype of the Jew moneylender, that's where it, 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 was, it started from, right, because of yes. interest. I mean, the, first of all, that... So is he depicting himself somewhat in, the, in it? I mean, is there some form of identity there? I mean, those letters uh, were discovered in the 19th century. I mean, you know, so that... that uh, and they've never really been fully taken into account. I mean, yeah. they're, they're known, but I'm the only one who's made it, what I believe is called a simus. Uh, about them, um, and uh, people lent money all the time. Right. I mean, it's a, a, absurd to think that people weren't l loaning money at interest. I, I, no society can operate out, out, outside of New Guinea, uh, rural New Guinea, without money lending. I mean, it just it, it doesn't work that way. It, it was a, there, the, there was a, uh, there were ways of getting around the the. Uh, Canon law prohibition of loaning money, uh, and they, the Italians got around with it. I mean, at the highest level. I mean, yeah. the Jews are in this in this period. Nobody, I mean, in terms of money lending. I mean, they're they're uh, they don't they count for anything. Uh, but but it was convenient to. I'm just wondering if his experience as a money lender and the and the and and that give and take between the people who owed him money, if that kind of inspired him. To I write. do think I think two things are at play in. Shakespeare, I think Shakespeare, we don't know when Shakespeare started to loan money. Those letters from 1598, which is a year after The Merchant of Venice was written, but I imagine he was doing it all along. I think his father was probably doing it uh, as well. I think that there are two things that I think condition the representation of Shylock. Three things that condition the representation of Shylock, the, the complexity of the representation. One is the fact that Shakespeare, as I said, was in the business. Uh, second is that he grew up, I think, in a Catholic household in a, in a repressive Protestant oh. country that was attacking Catholics, yeah. and that he felt part of a despised or, or endangered uh, community. They were killing yeah. uh, Catholics uh, in England at that, yeah. uh, at that point who were uh, celebrating Mass. Yeah. Uh, and then the third is a murkier thing. I think Shakespeare always felt, as an artist, uh, a peculiar... Uh, uh, not profound, not alienation in the Marlowian sense, the way Christopher Marlowe felt, just the whole thing is a sham, but some complicated distance from the world that he lived in, some sense that he could see through things that other people couldn't see through so clearly about the world he lived in. And he had to deal, he's super intelligent, and he, he had to figure out how to negotiate his perceptions that that the, most of the values that people in his world lived by were ones that he thought right. you know, wouldn't hold up under serious scrutiny. And I think the plays are full of, of uh, characters who in various ways embody his sense of alienation or yeah. distance from the world that he lived yeah, in. Yeah, because these, even this passage number eight, I mean, if you read it just objectively without thinking about the you know, anti-Semitic like, tropes, I mean, it's pretty profound that he's 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 kind of asking a question that nobody at his time is asking right. about Jews. I mean, he's not no one yeah. is impersonating a Jew to the extent that he's saying this, which is basically, uh, are we not human as right. Jews? I mean, do we not? I mean, it's pretty profound. No interest in racial difference at all, by the way. And that there's clearly no he has no notion that Jews could be differentiated from Christians on racial grounds. So it's really, I mean, it, it, they're identical. Uh, they're they're in this case identical, of course. In the context of the Christian values of the play, we could say that Shylock says, uh, you know, if we, you wrong us, won't we revenge? Well, officially the Christians say, turn the other cheek. Uh, but the play suggests they're not turning any other, the other cheek. They're, they're doing what, they, uh, what everyone does when they're, if I slap you, you want to slap me back. I mean, right. it's the... Thank you. <laughs> So um, I'm going to just hold you for a few moments. If you need to leave, you can walk out. Well, I'm used to people walking out in the middle of my talks. <laughs> don't, don't, don't get offended in the slightest. I, uh, we, we have had your cars towed, so if you need your car, you'll have to come out. <laughs> and uh, the hourly rate goes up by 20%. So, um, <clears throat> so I, uh, 
I want to thank God for giving us all a, 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 this opportunity of getting together here tonight. And my name is Shmuley Heft, and I'm married to Toby Heft, and uh, Toby is the director of Shopdai. Uh, I am one of the founders of the organization in 1996. Today, um, God has been very good to us. We're here after 25 years of an organization in the home of two of our alums, Aaron and Ilana, who spent time at Yale. And I'm looking around the room and I see people like Mark and Catherine who have been away from New Haven now. It's gotta be 18 years because your oldest is 18 and the bris was in New Haven. So, uh, and we have of course alumni of Yale from, uh, I should note, it was class of 65, but he did Yale in three years, so he left in 64, is that right? That's right, you got it. you're way on top of it. Um, and uh, Jim Dow, who was here, who's the editorial editor of the Boston Globe, was here before, who's also a Yaley of the 70s, I believe, and a professor from the law school, Yard Listikin, and Shai Dromi, who's teaching at Harvard, and Graham Wood, from, uh, who's teaching at Yale, um, and Alex Bellick, one of our seniors at Yale's, um, one of our members of our organization who's been leading the institution this year is grandma and her friends. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, and then of course the most, the more recent alumni, there's about uh, seven or eight or 10 of us that have gone through Yale College that are here. Um, it's just absolutely wonderful, including Angie who's in from California. Um, and uh, so odd things bring people to Boston. It's not a Red Sox game, although I believe that we and I once had a Interesting interaction about Red Sox tickets with Leslie Epstein when his son yeah. was running. This was about 15 years ago. I didn't come to the game, but I think I got you the tickets. Yeah. I think you took my seats to the Red Sox game. Anyway, um, so uh, thank you. Um, it's very special because um, we're here. And uh, so I want to thank all of you who, who attended. And I want to thank, uh, of course, those of you who invited your friends, Shopdai. Um, there's not much mystery to it. There seems to be more mystery than there is. It's, it's fairly simple. It's a, it's, a, it's a conversation. It started in New Haven. It's growing, as you can see. And the only way to foster this type of conversation with uh, special people like S Professor Stephen Greenblatt is by inviting your friends, poking up your head and saying, what's, what's next? Where do we do it? Who could speak? Who do we invite? And just go, and it's, it's the human interaction. So on that note, um, I want to speak to, to Professor Stephen Greenblatt uh, because uh, we have been corresponding for 20 20 years, 21 years, Ridiculous. yeah, 21 years, and we've never met. So, yeah, so, and uh, you look exactly like I thought you would. <laughs> you look like a money lender. <laughs> this is great. So, um, so, yeah. so I'm glad to have, have finally made it. So I, um, I guess at a, there's nothing really personal about this. It's, it's more like I. I for the community, and Mark and Catherine, the elders in the room, I think know what I'm talking about. Um, so I just wanted to say a few things at a personal level. So we met because in 2001, for those of you who know, Yale celebrated its tercentennial. We had an idea which was to interview 300 of Yale's most accomplished, Jew, uh, most accomplished alumni of Jewish descent. We sent the film crew around the country, and uh, they went out and interviewed people. And so when we came to Boston, we made a few stops, and of course, Stephen Greenlet was on the list, and we interviewed him. Um, I didn't watch your interview until years later, or maybe a year later, two years later, and I, I started going through the hundreds of hours of film footage that was coming back from all these prominent people that had gone through the university and talked about their experience. So tonight I just want to address two of the things you said on that film. Um, we haven't released the tapes yet, um, although we joked before about how, how things, uh, you know, we're like a vineyard, we'd like to let them age, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Stephen Schwartzman actually has been e e emailing me um, for his tape, and I, I figure the longer I wait, the more expensive it's going to get for Stephen Schwartzman. <laughs> so, uh, he, a he actually has been calling the office already. I think he almost you know, wakes me up at night. So that's, uh, that's good. You know, we have a couple of people waiting for their tape. So, and tonight we told Professor Greenblatt it's kind of an off the record conversation. <clears throat> so um, I have a lot of things to say. I'm only going to say one or two of them. Um, you, t you told two very t powerful stories in that 48-minute uh, interview, and you opened up with one about how, as a little child, you grew up in this um, Bostonian, uh, Newtonian home. Is it, was it Newton? Yeah. Newtonian in the, new, in the Boston sense of the word. <laughs> Newtonian in the Bostonian t uh, term. And, um, and uh, how you once went to the synagogue as a young child, and you were told that when the priests bless the people, the Kohanim bless the people. If you look at the face of the Kohanim, um, you could 
in your instance, you were taught that it could, it could, it, you could, you could, you would die. You were determined to die because you weren't supposed to look at the priest when you were being blessed. And but you were a risky guy, and you, you had a set of nuts, and you basically said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this out." And you, <laughs> in the middle of the prayer, you you pulled the talus, the, the prayer shawl over from away from your eyes, and you looked, and you said, "I'm gonna risk my life." And nothing happened. And so you went home and said, I've been pickpocketed is the term you used in the film. I've been pickpocketed. I, I survived. And so that gives you sort of an impression of what can happen to a young child who's told things about what happens to you when you do a sin and they don't happen. Fascinating story. 46 minutes later in the film, you tell a story about going to Jerusalem with Moshe Habertal, who's a great professor at Hebrew University, teaches at NYU and at the Yale Law School. And you went uh, because Moshe said to you, you know, you're here. Let's go to, to Me'a Sha'arim, which is the ultra, ultra Orthodox Hasidic neighborhood in Jerusalem, and go visit a real seminary. Uh, the, the Harvard, Yale, Princeton, MIT, Stanford uh, combination of yeshivas of, of ultra-Orthodox Talmudic scholarship. And you walked into a room, and there you saw hundreds of people studying texts from the 6th, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th century in ancient Hebrew and Aramaic and all these multiple languages and arguing in this deep dialectic about nuances of, of legal law and Jewish history and uh, how we practice certain things. And you, you, the quote there that I remember was that um, you said uh, this was a, a world that was a disagreeable world, as is the world of, of academia, perhaps disagreeable to a world of ultra-Orthodox Jews who live in a very traditional life and seminary. Um, and you're, um, you were so fascinated by this, uh, this world of learning that though your dislike didn't vanish, your contempt did. So I want to read something. Because you read from Shakespeare, I want to read Stephen Greenblatt, because I never read Shakespeare until, this I will confess, never read Shakespeare. I'm not a big fiction reader in general. I read nonfiction. I didn't read Shakespeare until after I read all of Stephen Greenblatt's books on <laughs> Shakespeare. <laughs> that takes longer than reading, I think, what is it, 38 plays or something? <laughs> you're, catch, you're catching up. I didn't read Shakespeare until, but then, and then when I decided to read Shakespeare, I only read The Merchant of Venice. So I want to read something from one of Stephen's great works called um, The Rise and Fall of Adam and Eve. And although it's the biblical story, it wasn't the first book of yours I read. I first read about how you think about the Enlightenment, which was Swerve. I have no solution to what baffled Darwin himself. But the problem returns to, but the problem, and this is the problem of the Adam and Eve narrative in the Bible and how we interpret it returns us to the continuing life of the story of Adam and Eve. For many people today, including me, that story is a myth. The long tangled history from archaic speculation to dogma, from dogma to literal truth, from literal to real, from real to mortal, from mortal to fraudulent, has ended in fiction. The Enlightenment has done its work, and our understanding of human origins has been freed from the grip of a once potent delusion. The naked man and woman of the garden with the strange trees and the talking snake have returned to the sphere of the imagination from which they originally emerged. But that return does not destroy their fascination or render them worthless. Our existence would, in fact, be diminished without them. They remain a powerful, even indispensable, way to think about innocence, temptation, and moral choice, about cleaving to a beloved partner, about work and sex and death. They are unforgettable embodiments at once of human responsibility and of human vulnerability. They convey with exceptional vividness the possibility of deliberately choosing in pursuit of knowledge to disobey the highest authority or, alternatively, the possibility of being seduced into making a foolish choice whose catastrophic consequences will be felt for all time. They hold open the dream of a return somehow, someday, to a bliss that has been lost. They have the life, the peculiar, intense, magical reality of literature. So the Enlightenment, the myth of the Bible and Eve, of, of Adam and Eve, the Enlightenment, fiction, hence the Bible as literature. Now, I don't want you to, for one moment, assume that Stephen Greenblatt's story about not dying in any way diminished his faith in God, uh, nor does his perhaps uh, continued dislike, though not contempt, of the yeshiva world, nor what he says in this book give you a real picture of who Stephen Greenblatt is. He's a much, much more complex, passionate believer. In fact, there's a rumor that he's moving to Mea Sha'arim, the ultra-Orthodox <laughs> community in Jerusalem and uh, le leaving, leaving Boston. But in light of those two stories, um, I listened very carefully tonight, and I think uh, for me personally, this is personal, I think the only answer to all of these things is to be more Jewish. To be more and more and more Jewish. And as you mentioned, it's not going away. So let's master it. 
And as you said, it emboldened you. And as you tell so many stories, it emboldened you. I'm Jewish. This is what they think of the Jews. Who's this guy, Shakespeare, anyway? It's a great play. It's a great story. There's one Jew. You can look, I'm not going to write a review on your, on your talk tonight. But to be more Jewish, but to be more Jewish means to know more. And to know more means first to know more about Jewishness. And so tonight I want to give you a gift. Maybe you have it. Catherine and I were joking. Are you giving Stephen Greenwald a book that you think he doesn't have? <laughs> he definitely doesn't have the book that I'm going to give him tonight. He may have a version of the book. But I want, I want to say this. Shakespeare lived in the end of the 16th and beginning of the 17th century. The same time that Shakespeare lived, there was another great writer, actually uh, an anthologist, essentially, whose name you share. And I learned this week that your name is Yaakov Shlomo. Ben Sviel. So St Stephen Greenblatt's Hebrew name is Yaakov Shlomo ben Svio. So at the end of the 16th century, the beginning of the 17th, there was a great Jew whose name was Yaakov, and his father's name was Shlomo. So he and his father shared your two first names. And we have a concept in Jewish law that says, which is that the child is an extension of a father. And so if this man's father was Shlomo and he is only an extension of him, there's a conjunction there and the two names become one. So in some ways you share his name with him. And what he did was, in the period of the, perhaps the greatest literary scholar Shakespeare of, of all times, what he did was he says, you know, the Jews are going to open up the Talmud and the Talmud is very complex. It's 2,000 pages of arguments and fighting and dialectic and raw, real, subtle dispute that goes on among sages in really deep commercial law and marriage law and divorce law and very, very, very nuanced arguments. But who can get through all that? Who can possibly master that? The average person, the ignorant Jew, <coughs> even the scholar will never master it. So what he did was he said, ah, the literature, the literature, Stephen. He says, let's, let's find the literature. So he collected all the stories of the Talmud, the legends, the parables, the allegorical narratives, all the easy stuff that one could read and maybe be Talmudic about. No one's more Talmudic about Shakespeare than Stephen Greenblatt. He takes two lines and writes chapters and, and extrapolates. You don't even know where he's going with it. How could he possibly make those assumptions, Professor Stephen Greenblatt? But he does, because that's the art. That's the art of literature. So Yaakov Shlomo, this great man, Ibn Khabib, who goes from Spain for obvious reasons, to Salonika in the 15th century. And then the sixth starts to compile all the stories. And he writes, a, and he takes that book and he collects it. And he calls it Ayin Yaakov. He says it's the eye of Jacob. It's the eye of Jacob. And there's a lot of reasons why he called it that. My simple reading is because the eye sees. So to pierce, to understand Jacob, the third of the patriarchs, the Jewish people, here are the stories. Here's the literature. So Adam and Eve, it happened, it didn't happen. Some believe it, some don't. Read the book. The myth, the enlightenment has arrived, but the literature will always be there. So we take Ayn Yaakov. Do you have an Ayn Yaakov at home? No. I found the book that Stephen Greenblatt doesn't have. <laughs> and it's three volumes. There were eight or nine different versions of the Ayan Yaakov in the bookstore. I bought you the one raw. <laughs> I, have the, I have the English translation in there. But I don't, want you to get, I don't want you to get carried away. And I'll tell you why I don't want you to get carried away. Because I'm going to start. We'll start together. We'll do it maybe once a month, maybe once in two weeks. <laughs> I'll get on the phone. And we'll read the greatest literature. And then you'll write the English commentary <laughs> on the Ayn Yaakov. And so this is my gift. It's a set of Ayn Yaakov, the collection of stories collected from the Talmud, thousands of pages. And perhaps that literature will measure up to the great literature. And I'll end by saying, that as a little boy, you stood in the synagogue and you moved the prayer shawl away during the prayer to look up at the Kohan because Kohan, they told you something really bad would happen to you. And you made a bet with God, and you said, ah, let me see if this really, 
if it's real, if it's real or it's not real. And you said you, you didn't see God like they told you you would. And you didn't die, and you were pickpocketed. Well, Stephen Greenblatt, Yaakov Schleimer, Ben Sviel, I did see God. I saw God when I watched a film of a great man 20 years ago tell a story about how as a little child he was looking for God. Good night.